saw her standing in his presence on holy ground. Well, if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew 27. And again, grateful that you're here today. We'll read just a few verses at the end. Uh, verse 57. Matthew 27, verse 57. And uh, again, I just want to uh, thank you, church, and thank Brother Will. Uh, it's a very, very big blessing uh, for me to, whenever I can't be here, uh, to know that things are, are um, somewhat in control. Amen, right? Uh, I was going to say in control, but I thought, no, it's Will. I can't say that. No, just tease it. But appreciate Brother Will and his family and so many um, things I take for granted. Anytime I ever talk to another preacher, they're like, you still got Will? You are so lucky. You're so lucky. I'm like, you can have him for a week and you won't think. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just teasing. I appreciate uh, everyone's involvement, investment, and things in church. And thank you guys. But um, uh, very thankful to be able to spend a little time with my dad before he went to heaven. And uh, then... Um, with my family, wife, and kids this last week. Matthew 27, verse 57. <clears throat> when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate, begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say unto the people, He's risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Let's be seated, we'll bow to pray. Father, I thank you publicly, allowing me to uh, uh, be behind the pulpit today. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray that it would be uh, seen and sensed and, and it would have uh, uh, its will and way with our lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for writing it. Thank you, God, for preserving it. And Lord, thank you for Jesus being the subject of it. Lord, I pray that um, you would bless our church, Lord. Thank you for the people that are here this morning, thank for friends and family, decisions and direction. And then God Almighty, I pray that, that you would have um, preeminence today. I pray that Jesus would be honored and glorified. Lord, we're asking for your presence this week, our Bible school plans and kids around our community. I pray that they would uh, be in the house of the Lord. Father, thank you for the blessings, thank you for the burdens, and thank you for um, uh, your will and your way through all those things to... Uh, <clears throat> make us to be more like Christ. You've already revealed to us our destiny in the presence of heaven forever. And thank you for that price you paid. We we'll pray for those who couldn't be here today, those that wouldn't be here today, and those that um, should have. Lord, I just pray that, that you would be with every need and situation. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you uh, obviously see the screen, uh, be sure, got a seal. That's not the... the the stone over the sepulcher, but they were trying to make it as sure as they could. Notice that word is in uh, two places there, in uh, verse 64, uh, and then also in verse 66. They, uh, they went to uh, Pilate and said, we don't want this to be worse than the first. We've got to make sure he stays in that grave. And he gave them. Whatever they needed, whatever they wanted, to make it as sure as possible. Uh, we live in a day when there's very few things that are for sure. Uh, there's just very few. 
Uh, I can tell you this, it's appointed a man once to die, and after this a judgment. All of us, unless the Lord would, uh, would uh, come in the clouds and receive us, uh, those that are saved early, we're all going to face, it's surety that the wage of sin is death. There are some things. Somebody said death and taxes and the Bengals losing in the playoffs. Amen. Those are all for surety things. But there's very few things in life that are for sure. And uh, uh, I, I uh, uh, was, was teasing, when, and I know Will now, we had a, a big, a big um, uh, un, unplanned layover, one of the plane flights, and and they said, hey, it's just a little part we've got to get fixed. I'm like, okay, that's no problem. They said, oh, it was a light bulb. Sure it was, sure it was. And uh, then, then it, it, one hour turned into two hours, two into four, four into seven. And I thought it was that movie where the guy lives in the airport overnight, you know, with uh, four kids and, the, and everything. But um, after getting uh, to where we we're going uh, through our flights, the next day in the news, I seen in, in New York that there was uh, an airplane landing and one taking off, and they missed each other by 500 feet. The a FAA is looking into it. I'm like, wow, I'm glad I wasn't that flight. Amen. And, uh, and then Wednesday, an uh, 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 airplane in, in Tampa was taking off, to, uh, and the, the wheels on the land, running gear, the landing gear, blew off, and they, they, they couldn't take off. And I thought... Wow, even when you think you're for sure, you're never totally for sure. Now, put in perspective, because I, I, I wanted to do, do a little calculation. I'm a math guy, and I, I read an article that said over the last two decades, very few people have, have been killed in commercial flights in America. Thank the Lord. 360,000 have died in car wrecks in that same time, which tells you that you ought to be careful driving more than flying, right? or flying with a preacher while he's driving. Amen? All those things can go. But you know, what, some things you think are for sure, there, there's very few things that are ever for sure. And in the Bible here, <clears throat> looking at the passage, they, they tried to make the grave sure for Jesus. Now, this is the first grave anyone's ever tried to make sure in the history of time. Because people don't rise from the dead. When you bury them, you don't check to make sure they're there three, four, five, six days later. Can somebody agree with that? This is a unique situation that they would even be worried about him coming out of the grave. And the first thing I want you to see in verse 57, notice a, a disciple named Joseph. I got confused in my mind. I know that never happens to you, right? But uh, I, I had more... Uh, more sympathy for um, public speakers who don't always say what they mean in their mind this morning, because I got confused on Joseph and Nicodemus. But in verse 57, Joseph is a disciple, and he's one that's here at the end, following Jesus. And that word disciple, Brother Will preached on a couple of times on Wednesdays, a learner, a follower. And notice there are named disciples, but there are also other people that were willing to follow the Lord in that, those days. What's interesting about Joseph is here, he's following him all the way to the end. And that's one of our doctrines in the Baptist church. It's called the perseverance of the saints. If you ever want to know what the church believes, there's a list of those things. And, and a lot of churches will have a list of things, what they believe. We try to go through them uh, periodically, especially as, as the Bible would come across a doctrine that, that we are uh, uh, holding to or... or um, more uh, known for, but the, the, our, the doctrine in, in uh, uh, 1 John chapter 2, it's called, we call it the perseverance of the saints. What that means is someone who's truly a saint, someone who's truly been saved by grace, they will persevere until the end. They'll stay connected to the Lord because, hey, if you believe in the Lord, there is no other option. Why, what would it cause me to go to some other source? I believe Jesus is it. Not that holding on to him is what takes you into heaven, but what holding on and, and persevering, it identifies you that you really do believe and you really are connected to the Lord. And so it's not an, uh, uh, an at odds doctrine with our faith. Sometimes Baptist churches are known for casseroles, <laughs> baptismal tanks, and once saved, always saved. And sometimes they're known for being mean. 
I don't like those. I want to be a nice church, and I hope that we'll have a good testimony wherever we go. Um, but in this passage, Joseph was a disciple. He's there at the end when it's not popular, when all the other disciples were fleeing away. Peter was cursing and hiding and denying. Here's Joseph saying, I want his body. I'll take care of his body. What's in it for that? He just wanted to be a part of his Lord. And he had a new sepulcher just hewn out of the rock. I think I was in it. I don't know for sure. But uh, there was a, a rock uh, mountainside where the garden was at the bottom. And inside that mountain they carved out a spot for three bodies to be lain in that sepulcher. Well, whatever the case, I want you to see that he's called a disciple. And I hope that that would be something that God could call us. He would call us disciples. He knows your name because he wrote it in the book of life. Amen? Amen. But wouldn't it be great if God could call you, hey, Joe, hey, John, hey, Jim, the disciple. The one that's persevering unto the end. The one that's there when no one else seems to be interested or invested. And so this passage starts out with a disciple. Then it goes into the body being delivered unto Joseph. Look at verse 58. He went to Pilate. He begged the body of Jesus. Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. You don't have a death unless you have a body. A confirmed death. There may be missing, but when you got a body and and the life of it's not in that body, you know you had a death. My friend, the body of Jesus was wrapped in linen, laid in a tomb because he didn't come off the cross and hide for three days. He didn't fake a hoax of a resurrection. No, Pilate gave the body to Joseph so that it was put in a tomb. Think about this. The Pharisees are so worried about the body, they weren't worried about Jesus playing a hoax and pretending to be dead. They went to Pilate and said, we want to make sure that grave is secure. They, there was no argument that he died. You follow me? There's a whole religion that teaches their billion followers that Jesus faked his death and did not really die. Did you know that? A billion or more followers in the world believe that Jesus was taken off the cross, hid out for a couple days, nursed back to health, and then appeared like he'd risen from the dead. No, the Bible says, and even the enemies against Jesus, they didn't say, hey, make sure that that we have Jesus in our possession so he doesn't get loose. No, make sure he stays in the grave because he's already dead. Interesting. Interesting, that dynamic. If you were um, Sherlock Holmes and you went back to study the facts of the case, that would be something that would be important to validate and to reassure we have a death. It was not something that was just hoaxed or deceiving in the resurrection. No, he was in the grave. Then look at the claim. Verse number 63. They came to Pilate. These are the Pharisees. I guess we got to look at verse 62 real quick. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the day of preparation in the Bible and in every instance of Jewish culture is the day before the Sabbath. That's why that uh, I believe that Jesus died on Friday, the day of preparation. It's in the book of John that explains that. But I want you to see this. The women came to anoint the body of Jesus early on the first day of the week because they weren't going to go on the Sabbath day. But these Pharisees, who are the ones who are preaching the law, who accuse Jesus of breaking the Sabbath day by healing someone, you know what they had no problem doing? Going to Pilate and trying to make sure and pay off some soldiers that he don't get out of the grave. Isn't that ironic? The guys that accused Jesus of doing good on the Sabbath were willing to do bad on the Sabbath. They, they didn't mind leaving their home and leaving the the ritual and the the religious observance of the the Sabbath day. No, they're in Pilate's office. We need more soldiers. 
We've got to make sure that grave is sure and secure, and you can't let anyone get to the body. They are hypocrites. And then look at verse 64. Not only are they breaking the Sabbath day, which they accuse the Lord Jesus of breaking, they said, we remember that, that deceiver. That's what they called him. He's the truth, the life, the way, amen? They called him the deceiver. That deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I'll rise again. They weren't asking for a continual 10-year watch of the cemetery. They weren't saying, Pilate, we need a Roman guard here 24-7 for the next year. No, it was going to be known really quickly whether Jesus was true or not. Just three days. We just need a watch for a short time. Really, Friday's already gone. Saturday they're in the midst of. We just need a watch for a short time. Can you give us that? And then in verse 64, he not only called, they called Jesus the deceiver, but they call his followers thieves. It says, Command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. I mean, Peter and John had a horrible rap sheet of stealing stuff all the time, right? You, you read that in the Bible, didn't you? You know, Matthew, uh, uh, all, all these guys, Luke, they're just horrible thieves. They're stealing everywhere they go. <clears throat> they, they stole a donkey. That's a bad joke. They didn't, right? They, they weren't stealing. They weren't thieving. You know what I see with this is your personal testimony as a disciple and as a follower of Christ is very important to someone who's not yet a believer and a follower of Christ. The way that you and I carry out, carry on, carry in, the way we live our lives, our integrity, our honesty, and let's just be honest, we, <clears throat> we are sinners we do have faults and failures. Don't everybody say amen too loud on me, but I got some, amen. Everyone does. But the point being is, there ought to be a different lifestyle, a different angle, a different um, uh, whatever, uh, 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 just uh, direction of our lives, because if they were really thieves, they wouldn't have had people following them anyway. But the Pharisees said, oh, we've got we to gotta secure his body because those thieving disciples, they're going to come steal him away and lie to keep their religion going. Boy, when you've got to lie to keep your religion going, you've got a lot more problems than what you're involved with and what you've got going. The disciples will come and steal him by night. Your character is very important in the Christian life. Bible Baptist Church, we're not perfect. We'll have faults and failures. We'll have things that we do that, that would be wrong and would need to be fixed in the eyes of the community around us from time to time. Just because that, that uh, we're a church, that does not mean that you uh, are, will have to, to be the perfection to be a part of it. But I'll tell you this, that's just the, ex the explanation for our sin. It's not an excuse for our sin. When we have sin, we ought to correct it and we ought to be humble about it. Brother Dwight, after church, came up to me and said, Preacher, Joseph and Nicodemus, you got those confused. And I said, thank you for telling me, Brother Dwight. I don't want to say something wrong that will mess up the rest of the sermon that I preach about. Y'all say amen to that? And that's just my, my confusion in the moment in the early service. But look, I, I think that all of us ought to have a goal and ought to have a, a God-given desire that we would be honest in our dealings we would be honorable in our profession. We would be humble in whatever victory. And we'd be graceful in whatever defeat that we might come into. Amen. This disciple, the Joseph, and the disciples, Pilate wasn't worried about them stealing the body. He said, you guys go make it as sure as you can. He didn't send another platoon of soldiers. Because if he did, they'd all been found laying down in the grave too. Yeah. Then the details. Verse 64, he said, make it as sure as you can. Verse 66, so they went and made the sepulcher sure. Verse 65, make it as sure as you can. Three times you see that word sure, and I want you to know that they could not 
keep it sure because Jesus was not going to stay in the tomb. All the authority and all, they sealed the tomb. They stayed with the tomb. The sepulcher was sure. They set a watch. They sealed the stone. They made it as sure as they could. All the power on the outside could not keep the power on the inside from coming out. All the authority of the world could not keep the author of salvation from staying in the grave. He rose again and he proved himself victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He took the sting of death for me. Amen. I know that one day I'm going to die, and I pray, and I'm so, man, I've got such an example. Uh, my, many of you gave me condolences, and thank you, our family. My dad went to be with the Lord. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so grateful that people are kind to my mother. She's doing great, but my dad's doing better. He's in heaven. And what a blessing to have peace, to know when, when you come to that point, and, and my dad wasn't asking me, what's going to happen when I die, son? My dad didn't ask me, I'm worried about dying, son. No, my dad said, are my feet swelling? Is this it? That's what he said. I said, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a nurse. I woke him up at 3.30 in the morning on Wednesday, and I said, Dad, you okay? You need some medicine? He said, what are you doing awake at 3.30? I said, what are you doing awake at 3.30? I was hearing him breathe and labor, and I, I was surprised he was conscious. And then, j- just to hear him tell the preacher, my, my, uh, the pastor at Mount Orb, he, he went to him and, and visited him at the hospital and came home, uh, came to our house, my mom and dad's house on Tuesday. And I told Ted, I said, hey, I don't know if my dad is going to be awake. He's been sleeping more. I'm trying to let him rest up so he can see our kids and, and a few family. And he said, that's okay, I'll pray with your mom. And we got there and my dad said, come on in here, Ted. And grabbed his hand and Ted said, John, so good to see you at home and not at the hospital. And he said, I'm not home yet. Wow, when you've got a peace about the one who came out of the grave, you can have peace when you go to your grave. I love it that Jesus took the sting of death. Corinthians says that. Reminds me of that story. I know a preacher used to tell this at at funerals, but there was a, I don't know, some of these stories are are just analogies, and and I don't know uh, how true, but a farmer was in a truck with his granddaughter driving down the country road with the windows down. That was that was what we called uh, uh, 50, 55, 4, 455 air conditioning, right? Four windows down and going 55 miles down the, air, down the road. And, um, and, if, and if, uh, if your dad chewed tobacco, you'd have, you'd have freckles in the back seat, amen? Yeah, but um, that's a bad story. Anyway, but <clears throat> this little girl, a honeybee flew in the window and she was scared of it. She was frightened by it. And the grandpa said, don't worry. And, and he tried to swat that honeybee and... It landed his hand, and he just took it, and it stung his hand. And after it stung his hand, he said, you don't have to worry about it stinging you anymore. The honeybee only has one sting. And you know, our Lord took the sting of death for us. Amen? Amen. When we come to it, it doesn't have the same fear and the same weight that it did before. Now, you get a bumblebee in your car, you better run, okay? Run for cover. They sting you multiple times. But a honeybee's just got one sting, and that grandpa took it, and then the little girl didn't have to be afraid anymore. Oh, I'm not afraid of this thing of death. When, when you see this scripture and about setting the, the, sealing the stone and setting a watch, they were worried that death wouldn't hold a man, that somebody would come and take him out. Oh, no one had to take Jesus out. He came out in his own power. What a blessing that you can have peace when you come to that point in your life. I don't think there's any, any greater gift that my dad could have given me. Watching his confidence and seeing his, his peace as he went to heaven. The sermon that I want to preach to you, and I've had a couple weeks where I think, what am I going to preach when I get back? I'm so excited to preach! And I'm preaching to you something that I preached in 2007. And what I thought in the middle of the sermon this morning, I can preach this in 2024 and be just as sure about it as I was in 2007. Watch this. You can't be sure about a lot of things in this world. Hey, we just learned last night, we're not even sure who's going to be in the election come November. On either side. 
things can change in a moment. We're not sure that I'll be alive to vote in November. Nothing is for sure in this life, but let me give you some things that are for sure in Scripture. The first one, go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. They tried to make the grave sure, and it could not be made sure enough. 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 19. The Bible says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you this? You can be sure about your Scripture. You can be sure about your Scripture. This verse says we have a more sure word of prophecy. I love the thought because I'm a mathematic uh, uh, major. I, I... Think with numbers in my mind and greater than and less than and all those things. When I see the word more sure, I'm thinking, what's it more sure than? What's it compared to? And the answer is in the verses in front of it, talk about Peter being an eyewitness. And he said that he was there when he heard the voice say, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. He was an eyewitness of the resurrection. He ran to the sepulcher that morning, a little bit after John and the ladies. And Peter saw an empty tomb on the first day of the resurrection. Peter was there when Jesus appeared in the room. Peter was there when he came on the sea, all those events. And Peter said, you know what? What we're writing down, because it's not what I saw and heard, it's from the Holy Ghost, it's more sure than if I told you myself. That's what Peter's telling you about the Bible. I believe all the Bible is written by God. Now, he used men, and, he, and it tells us that in this passage, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But they weren't writing what they witnessed. They were writing what they were inscribed, inspired to write. The Holy Ghost is the author of Scripture. It's amazing to me that the Bible is written in such a way that a skeptic can look at and find more assurance than any other work of antiquity. But yet the believer knows that it's God who wrote it in the first place. And when a skeptic looks at the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you find some little differences and some little details that one seen the other didn't. Or one looked at this way and the other looked at that way. And you say, how can the Bible not be the same? Oh, my friend, if all four witnesses had the exact same thing to say, you'd be more, be more concerned about it. Do you realize how many different stories have come out of an event that happened 12 hours ago in Pennsylvania? We've got three or four different names of who the shooter was from all different people. From the FBI, CIA, doesn't anyone know who this guy is? Or did anyone, how about the guy who saw him on the roof and, and told the, there's all kinds of things that go on. My point being this, you can be sure about what God tells you in the Bible. I, I believe it's the truth. And I'm convinced of it more in 2024 than I was in 2007 when I first saw this in Scripture. You can be sure about the Scripture. Not only is it more sure than an actual eyewitness, it's more sure because of the author who wrote it. And finally, it'll remain sure because it's God's own hand that's preserving it. We're not counting on archaeologists to uh, preserve our faith. No, we're counting on the Lord Jesus, God Almighty. In Psalms chapter 12, it said, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The Bible says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. Now, I'm a purist. I believe the Bible that we hold is God's word for the English-speaking people. We're going to use the King James Bible as long as I'm the preacher here. Amen. But can I just tell you this? You read another version of the New Testament, and you're still going to see Jesus died and rose again. You're still going to be able to surmise that He was God in human flesh. 
Now, it might take a little bit of working if you get a, if you get a New World Translation that the Jehovah Witnesses use, but you can even prove it in their own scripture that you can see that the, the main tenets of the Christian faith are still true no matter what version of the Bible that you use that's in modern day. Now, I don't know what version will be in 20 years from now. I think they get watered down the more they keep coming out. I'm just going to stick with the one that my daddy used, that my grandpa used, that my preacher used. And I, I think that the power is in the book, not in the translation. Y'all say amen? Notice, you can be sure about your scripture. Second of all, go to Numbers chapter 32. Numbers chapter 32. Growing up, I heard this verse all the time, and I didn't know where it was at or what the context was of it, but my mama quoted it to me. She made sure that I would get the meaning of it, and she would say this. She wouldn't quote the whole verse. She would just quote half the verse, but she got the point across. She'd say, Jeremy, be sure your sin will... You had the same mama I did. Be sure your sin will find you out. You can be sure of that. No one gambles and wins with sin. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care your intention. I don't care your, uh, uh, your long-term goal. If God calls it a sin and you're found within, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Sin. Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. I'll give you the context of it. Here's the verse. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure it will. The context is the children of Israel have been wandering through the wilderness. They're getting ready to get their inheritance. It's been almost 40 years. Moses is getting ready to die. They come up to the River Jordan. Joshua is going to lead them across as the River Jordan will split in the next book. But as they get ready to go, the tribes of Reuben and Gad, they say, hey, we like the land on the east side of Jordan. Let us have our inheritance here. And Moses said, okay, but boys, you didn't fight these battles alone. The other nine, ten tribes have been involved with beating Sihon and Og and the kings of that eastern side. And Moses said, don't you think you're going to stop here and not go help the rest of your brothers and the rest of Israel win their battles in the land of Canaan? If you stay on this side of Jordan and you don't go help them, be sure your sin will find you out. That's the context of the story. And they said, Moses, we'll go. <clears throat> Let us build some booths for our cattle and some places for our kids I don't think the cattle and kids live together. Don't get me wrong, okay? But they, that's what they're going to build. And then they would send their warriors over and to fight the battles in the land of Canaan. Well, Moses said, okay, that's your word. <clears throat> but be sure your sin will find you out. Have you ever lived life long enough <clears throat> that you realize you might be reaping something you sowed when you were younger? Oh, me. And you think, I know why this happened. I know why this happened. Remember Joseph's brothers when they went to Egypt and Joseph had the food put back in their sack and then they, he, they found him with it and they said, no, you leave one of your brothers. And they're like, oh no. Oh, this is because of what we did to Joseph. This is happening to us. They had a guilty conscience because be sure your sin will what? What do I do? The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. I'd confess it. I'd, I'd much rather confess and be clear than lie and be wrong. I'd much rather get out in the open and have the shame than let it to be secret and always know why it's to blame. You hear that? Woo! Be sure your sin will find you out. Well, preacher, you didn't preach on it, so I don't have to quit doing it. I didn't get caught, so I'm okay. 
No, that's not the case. And especially if you're a Christian, a, a child of God, you cannot get away with sin because God would be blessing unrighteousness. What would that say about him to the rest of the world? He will not be accused in the judgment of letting you be blessed with sin and then disciplining somebody else because of it. Amen? Be sure you're not going to get far with it. You're not going to get away with it. You be sure about it. Listen, Christian, the way you live matters. Well, I'm saved, preacher. That's all that matters. No, you're still here. Everything matters. Be sure your sin will find you out. Thirdly, and I'm almost finished. That'll make you feel better. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Look at verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Look at this, verse 69. And we believe and are what? Sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? One of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. You can be sure about the scripture, it's true. You can be sure about sin, it will get you. But you can be sure about the Son of God. After walking with him for three and a half years, Peter was more convinced of who he was than ever before as the time kept going on. Peter said, where else are we going to go, Lord? You're it. We are sure that you are the Son of God. Oh, my friend, I hope that you're sure that Jesus is God in flesh. That's what they were saying. They were claiming and confessing that Jesus is the gift of God sent to us so that we would have forgiveness and mercy in front of God the Father. Oh, you need to be sure about who Jesus is. I almost got a green and yellow t-shirt down in, in uh, Mexico on vacation. And it said, Juan Deer. And had a picture of a mule on it. And it was Juan's deer. And I almost got one because I, I thought, oh, people will see that and they'll think I got a John Deere shirt on. I got a Juan Deere shirt on. And I didn't. You ought to be sure that you got the real thing with Jesus. You ought to be sure that he is your Lord and Savior. He rose from the dead. And you're confidently trusting and counting on him for your righteousness. You're not counting on your church membership. You're not counting on your baptismal paperwork. You're not counting on your communion record. You're not counting on your, uh, <clears throat> on your good deed for some neighbor. No, you're counting on Jesus and him alone. When you got that, you can be sure. You can be sure. We ask people this question. Do you know for sure if you died today, that you'd go to heaven. Remember when someone asked you that for the first time? Some people say, boy, I hope so. I asked a guy this last week. He said, well, I don't think so. I don't know. I said, man, you can know for sure. <clears throat> you can have it settled. <clears throat> you can be as confident as anyone who faces death with Jesus. When you have the Jesus as the Son of God. Finally, go to Hebrews chapter number 6. Four things that you can be sure of in Scripture today. The Scripture, your sin, the wage of sin, the worry of sin, the weight of sin. Oh, be sure about it all. It'll find you out. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse number 19. Hebrews 6 is a very powerful chapter in my mind of the assurance of the, the reason why we're saved by Christ and Him alone. He's not dying a second time. He paid the price. It starts in Hebrews 5, laying out the requirements for the high priest. 
And it goes on in the chapter 6 and 7. And chapter 7, it finally ends with, He's able to save us to the uttermost in chapter 7, verse 25. But in Hebrews 6, 19, it tells us that we have two immutable things. Verse 18 does. It's impossible for God to lie in verse 18. That we might have a strong consolation of fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope before us. Verse 19 says, <clears throat> which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both, what would you say it with me? Sure and steadfast. It's sure. The anchor of our soul, which entereth into that within the veil. Now, I'm not a very skilled or experienced seaman. Um, I will tell you that the waves on Lake Erie were just as big as the ocean waves we were on uh, fishing, but I went fishing. You know why they call it fishing? Because it's not catching. That's why. And uh, we didn't catch much, but um, they caught a little, a little fish. They called it a bonita fish, a tuna, little, little tuna fish thing. But anyway, we we're out there, and they said, man, it's going to be choppy water today. And I thought, uh-oh, that don't sound good. He said, no, that'll be good, because we were trying to catch marlin. He said, in choppy water, you can see the marlin's fin go up. And down, and we'll be able to, to spot them easier. Sometimes when it's calm, you don't see it as much. And I'm like, okay, sounds good to me. And I noticed that there's always things going on under the surface. You just don't always see it. Yeah. And an anchor is something that is below the surface of the ship. And once that anchor is dropped, it keeps the ship from moving and swaying and going where it doesn't want to go. And it stays right where it should be. Do you realize that we have an anchor for our soul's hope is Jesus Christ? Amen. It's below the surface, a little deeper than skin level. It's a little deeper than just what you look like on a Sunday or, and how you appear uh, on the outward appearance. No, it's that depth in your heart that you've got an assurance and a hope of God. And it's the anchor of your soul. Once you get that settled, friend, it don't matter what's happened on top of the water. You've got something going on that's much stronger below the current. And it anchors your soul. Oh, I, I, I thought about this. So many things that get us worked up in life. But when you've got eternity settled, everything else is just small potatoes. When you've got heaven for sure, all the other things just really pale in comparison. I mean, I don't plan on burning a couch when my team loses in the final four. I've set a dumpster on fire, but not because my team lost. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm not going to lose sleep over whoever's in the White House come November. Amen. Boy, some of the rhetoric on both sides that the world's going to end if we don't get elected, yeah. Republican or Democrat. Y'all yeah. amen. amen. The world's going to keep going until Jesus takes it out. Not over who's elected. And last time I checked, the Bible says God sets up the kings and takes them down again. You get this eternity settled and the anchor of your soul, your flesh can have some joy and have some hope and life and smile on your face even when things don't go the way you want to in some specific race. Listen, friend, you ought to be sure about your soul. Hebrews chapter 6 says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Now, I'm so thankful I got something deeper than just what you see on the outside. I look in the mirror sometimes, I think, Who in the world is that fat old guy with a seven head instead of a forehead? And then I remind myself, I'm leaving this body. And I'm going to take my flight one day. Oh, yeah. Not because of what's on the outside, because of what's on the inside. The inner unseen man. Do you have that hope? Do you have that for sure? Do you know for sure? You can be sure about the scripture. And as I mentioned... I preached a sermon 2007, New Year's Eve 2007. And can I tell you, I'm just as sure about it in 2024 as I was in 2007. Amen. And you don't remember from 2007 because you forgot what you ate last week. Amen. 
Oh, get it for sure. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd be with the people that are in this congregation today. Those are getting prepared for decisions. Maybe there's a decision that needs to be made. Friend, if you're listening to my voice still and there's interest, there's a yearning, there's longing, there's something stirring inside of you that you need to get peace. You need to get peace that passes understanding. You need to have a surety of your soul anchored to the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you'd be honest and be willing and open today. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. I'm, my, my eyes are open, my head is up. You're here this morning, you say, Preacher, I know for sure that I'm going to heaven because of Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand as a testimony? Just up and right back down. You know it, you've got it settled. Hands all over the church, you can put it down. As the piano begins to play, maybe you couldn't honestly raise your hand. <clears throat> I'm not trying to, to point you out, I'm just trying to let you pick yourself out. I talk to you after church, invite you to come in a moment. But if you're here and you say, Preacher, that's me, I'm not sure about eternity. I'm not sure I got it settled. I don't know for sure, like you're mentioning. Someone like that, would you raise your hand? Preacher, pray for me. I'm looking at the right side. Someone there, looking at the middle. Someone praying. Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Look over the left. Someone like that. Preacher, pray for me. I'm not saved. I don't have it yet. Up and right back down. I won't call you out, but I do want to let you, me, and God know that you're being serious. That you want to get settled. Oh, Lord, I pray for other decisions. There might be folks that dabbling and diving into sin, thinking that they're going to profit or prosper from it. Lord, would you help them receive the message today? You be sure that sin will find you out. You're not going to get ahead with sin. Lord, thank you for your grace, your kindness, your mercy through our sin. You stay with us. You never leave us. Lord, would you bless the invitation, help decisions to be made. Maybe those need to follow in baptism since you've been saved. Maybe there needs to be a commitment since you got serious. Pray that you do business with God. We love you, Lord, today. Thank you, Holy Spirit, promising to be our guide and our conviction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing. Page 596, I surrender all. If that's you, you ought to come. All to Jesus I surrender.